Before we launch into Hebrews chapter 9, which is where we'll be today, so if you have your Bible, you want to go ahead and turn there, that'd be good. I want to share with you a couple of things uh, about how you are involved and how you can remain involved in the disaster relief efforts that are taking place across our nation right now. I've had many people ask, how can you be involved? How can I be involved? And um, I mean, it's an extremely difficult situation for many right now. And so... There are many great organizations, and there are always great opportunities before us. I have been recommending to anyone who asks, very singularly, that they support by donating to Send Relief. So let me say about Send Relief, okay? Uh, I don't know what comes to mind when you think about being a Southern Baptist. That's who we are. Let me, whatever comes to mind, let me go ahead and just leap to the best part about being a Southern Baptist, okay? I believe that no one is better at organizing and sending missionaries and organizing and sending disaster relief aid than Southern Baptists. And so when we talk about send relief, that is the disaster relief ministry of the Southern Baptists. And I can tell you firsthand, having lived in a community that was just decimated by hurricanes a couple years ago, Hurricanes Laura and Delta, that Sin Relief is an organization that is efficient, that they care about physical needs, and they care about spiritual needs. And so they're an organization that can be trusted. And so for this reason, we are partnering with Sin Relief as well. And I'm happy to tell you, I'm, I'm excited to tell you, that this last week, we as a church, you as a church, sent a donation of $10,000 to Sin Relief. And so that is going, not just to Florida, I know we have that here, but to all those areas that are, have been affected by the hurricanes. And that was possible because you give. And because there is a, a, a legacy of giving and generosity that is foundational to who we are as a church. And so I just want to say thank you for that because you give, but even more specifically because you have been giving. These funds were already there and marked specifically for disaster relief, which meant Uh, in the office, we were able to mobilize this very quickly, which means as we sit here today, these funds are already on the field helping and serving those who've been affected. And so I just want to say thank you for giving. Thank you for continuing to do that. Um, When we think about giving, it's it's very important that we, we keep this ever before us, that we give not primarily because of what those funds can do, but first and foremost, as a response to all that God has given. And so what that means is anytime we talk about generosity, anytime we talk about giving financially and supporting ministries like this, it is meant to first be an act of worship because because God has graciously poured out his blessing on us. However, it is not less than to say that when you give, ministry does happen and lives are impacted. So again, thank you for giving. I would ask that you please continue to do that. Um, You saw the link earlier. It's very easy to find. If you want to give directly to Sin Relief, we can help you do that. I would encourage you to think through that and pray through that. I would encourage you to continue giving to the ministries and the mission of this particular church as we seek to make an eternal difference in the lives of Magnolia and around the world. And so we're going to jump in to our passage. This is a long passage, again, as we think about all of Hebrews chapter 9. My prayer is that as we work our way through this book and work our way through these chapters, that all of these repeated themes will work their way into us so that we would be shaped by them, so that they would be formative for how we view our Father. The whole point of us engaging in the book of Hebrews in the way that we have is primarily for us as a people to be able to see Jesus more clearly and follow him more faithfully. And I believe that the words that we find in scripture, not just today, but throughout scripture, have the power to do that, to rouse us to faithfulness and to equip us to be obedient, to follow our Savior. So let's read, starting in verse 1, we're going to go all the way through verse 14. This is what the word of the Lord says. Now the first covenant also had regulations for ministry and an earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was set up, and in the first room, which is called the holy place, were the lampstand, the table, and the presentation loaves. Behind the second curtain was a tent called the most holy place. 
It had the gold altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered with gold on all sides, in which was a gold jar containing the manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the tablets of the covenant. The cherubim of glory were above the Ark, overshadowing the mercy seat. It is not possible to speak about these things in detail right now. With these things prepared like this, the priests entered the first room repeatedly performing their ministry. But the high priest alone enters the second room. And he does that only once a year and never without blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. Verse eight, the Holy Spirit was making it clear that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed while the first tabernacle was still standing. This is a symbol for the present time during which gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the worshiper's conscience. They are physical regulations and only deal with food and drink and various washings imposed until the time of the new order. But Christ has appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come in the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. He entered the most holy place once for all time, not by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a young cow sprinkling those who are defiled sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse our consciences from dead works so that we can serve the living God. So that's the first 14 verses. This is, this is rich. There's a lot here. There's um, so much to unpack. Uh, my hope and in, in intention here is to break this chapter into three sections for us to look at and talk about because I, I'm hoping that these three different sections will give us the most clarity into what it is that the author wants us to hear this morning. And so as we think about the first 14 verses, I'll go ahead and just jump to the conclusion that I want us to really think through and celebrate and build our lives on this morning, and that's this. Access to God is a big deal. Access to God is a big deal. Hebrews chapter nine presents a detailed contrast between the old covenant sanctuary, that is the tabernacle, and the new covenant heavenly sanctuary where Jesus Christ now ministers. This contrast makes it clear that the new covenant sanctuary is superior. That word superior and that theme has been throughout the book of Hebrews as we're talking about Jesus being superior. The text goes on and it, it discusses different aspects of the old covenant and the tabernacle in, in, in detail, or at least it mentions multiple different items, including the Ark of the Covenant, which was not invented by Harrison Ford for the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark. Just, we, we have to say it. We have to say it. Um, I would just encourage you, please don't let movies be the thing that determines your theology, okay? The book is always better. Um, I always say that. In this case, uh, it's not only that the book is better, the book is actually where we find the truth. And so, um, we'll move on from there. Anyway, all of these descriptions, as, as you read them, and all of these different things that it mentions, what we have to remember is that the old covenant was divinely prescribed. The new covenant is its fulfillment, not its contradiction. The New Testament covenant does not contradict the old one. It fulfills it. In the old covenant, we see promise. In the new covenant, we see fulfillment. And these work together um, just the way that God ordained it to be. Now, let me point out verse five to you. If you have everybody look at that, particularly at the end of the verse where it says, it's not possible to speak about these things in detail right now. I think that the author is addressing a question that, that you may have by writing it. And the question is this, why is it that we're not stopping, pausing, and looking at all of these things in much greater detail? Now, some of you may be thinking the opposite and thinking, this is enough, let's keep it moving, right? I don't know. But the truth is, the reality, as we have gone through the book of Hebrews, 
There's no way that we've come close to exhausting the truth that is found in this book. We just haven't had the time and and the ability to, to address everything in the fullness that we would like to. And I believe the reason is this, because we are on a mission. We're on a mission. And I think that's the very same thing that the author was writing about then, is I don't have time to go into details on all of these things that are so, so good and important. Why? Because we're on a mission. Make no mistake, the details are important. Absolutely. And we never want to forsake or ignore them. But there are things ahead of us that are most pressing. And in our lives, we must always maintain a posture where we are seeking to understand the things of God more deeply. I believe he wants to reveal those things to us. But the thing that is most pressing for me and for you today is not trying to figure out all the complexities of theology, but rather being obedient to the things that we do understand. And that's I just think that walking in obedience to the things that are plain has got to be where we major. And so the author, you can tell, he wants to unpack so much more, but he's on a mission. He's trying to point to Christ, who he is and what he's done. There are times when I hear people say things like, you know, when it comes to certain topics, if I just knew more about blank. But I don't think that's really the the things in our spiritual lives that trip us up. I think it's the things that we know oh so plainly that we fail to live out, that are the real danger for us. I once heard a pastor say that the deepest truth in all of the Bible is simply love your enemies, right? It's not hard to understand what that means. It's just hard to put it into practice. For us here at this time in this place, it is our great pursuit to fulfill the great commission by way of the great commandment. And may that be our single focus as we seek to understand as much as we are able to, but may we not be so bold as to demand of God more than he has divinely revealed. Scripture says of itself that that it gives us everything we need for a life of godliness. We can trust it. What he's given us may not be the answer to every question that you have, but it is enough to trust him and to follow him. And so let's press on, look at verse seven, specifically where it talks about the high priest alone would be the one to enter the most holy place. And entering that also required blood. Well, what's this all about? We cannot skip over or minimize the importance of God's holiness. What this is describing to us is how an an ordinary person could not merely enter into God's presence. Blood was required. For us today, I believe that the key for living our spiritual lives is an awareness of God's holiness. Because of Christ, we, we get to say that anyone can freely come, and I'm so grateful for that. But that invitation to freely come, we don't need to forget, is an invitation to freely come into the presence of a holy God. He is holy, holy, holy in the superlative. The high priest alone could enter into that place, and he had to only do it once a year. As you look through verse eight, it describes how the, those movements illustrated that, that ordinary folks like me and you did not have access to the presence of God. This is why, as we sit on this side of the cross, thinking about who Jesus is and what he has done, this is why we say access to God is such a big deal. Because where formerly we had no hope of ever entering, the door has been opened for sinners to be in God's presence. Guys, that's good news for us. When you look at verse nine, um, a question emerges. I'll point your attention there. Look at verse nine. Now, it doesn't say it outright. Here, the the verse, the, the scripture talks about cleansing of the conscience. But I really think a super important question emerges from that idea that we need to tackle today. And the question is this. How do I deal with the guilt I feel? It talks about cleansing Uh, Listen, is there any more relevant topic for us as we think about studying this ancient book in our lives here today? I believe there's only two people 
who are listening to this. One, the person who feels guilty. And two, the person who doesn't want others to know they feel guilty. Because this, this touches all of us, guys. This, this affects every single person. So what should we do? What can we do? How do I deal with the guilt that I feel? Some people have chosen just to ignore it. I mean, right, that's a, that's a legitimate strategy of the world. Probably it'll go away on its own. Just don't think about those things. Other people will try to rationalize it. Some people try to minimize it. I have a feeling that there's a lot of people here who are choosing to agonize over it. And it is that secret guilt that you've never told anybody about that is just tripping you up as you seek to run the life that God has called you to. Guys, I don't know where exactly you are today, but I know that guilt is something that we all think about and feel and need a way to deal with. And the old covenant could not adequately answer that question for us. How do I deal with this? You see, in the old covenant, uh, nothing, the, the product of it was not lasting. The old covenant could not deal with our true dilemma because the problem that we face, the barrier between me and my heavenly father, the barrier between me and God was never a curtain. It was my own sinful heart. And so this means that we have a problem because scripture teaches us that God is holy. And that means deep down, I understand that I have no business walking into his presence. I've got no grounds to justify myself, nothing that could earn me an audience with the God who is holy, holy, holy. I know in my spirit that I have fallen short, that I have not loved him in all the ways that I'm supposed to with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Guys, that means I have a problem, we have a problem, mankind has a problem, and the old covenant was like a huge spotlight illuminating just how deep the problem is. Which leads us into the next section of verses. Look at verse 15. It says, therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called might receive the promise of the internal inheritance because a death has taken place for redemption from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Where a will exists, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will is valid only when people die, since it is never in effect while the one who made it is living. That is why even the first covenant was inaugurated with blood. For when every command had been proclaimed by Moses to all the people, according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and goats, along with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled the scroll itself and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant that God has ordained for you. In the same way, he sprinkled the tabernacle and all the articles of worship with blood. According to the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. You know, it's passages like this, I mean, I know it's a lot, that, that I get, you know, someone on the outside may look at and they hear about the songs we sing and the, the, the verses we read and they think, man, there's a lot of blood. There's a lot of blood involved. And we need to just acknowledge that. It is. And I, it's very hard to even wrap our minds around the amount of blood we're talking about here. As we read through this passage and we, and we ask the Lord to speak to us, I'm hoping that what you hear, what you remember, and what you build your life on is this truth, that access to God is an absolutely big deal. And without the blood of Christ, we have no access. And so the, the thing to remember from this section is simply this, that the blood of Jesus is precious because it is the blood of Jesus that is our only hope of dealing with the guilt that we have. His blood makes dealing with this guilt a possibility. Think about that. Today, as we sit here right now, you can bring your guilt to him and give it to him. And through repentance, he'll take it and he'll wash you with his precious blood. What a glorious exchange that is offered. Now these first few verses in this section make it clear that there was no final and complete redemption underneath the old covenant. Those transgressions, they were covered by blood of many sacrifices, but they were not cleansed. That only happened with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. 
Romans 3 helps us to see this even more clearly. Paul writes, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God presented him as the mercy seat by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed. God presented him to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and justify the one who has faith in Jesus. Okay, so all of this is, is, is where our hope lies. We've got to see the blood of Jesus as something that is crucial, foundational, and precious to us. Uh, the author J.I. Packer, he wrote this, he said, how it is possible for Jesus to bear our penalty, we do not claim to know. Any more than we know how it is possible for him to be made man. But that he bore, it is the certainty which all our hopes rest. I think what he's saying is the same thing I'm saying. I don't know how to explain this to you. I just know that this is our hope. That the blood of Jesus is precious and it is effective and it is the thing that makes access to God possible. When we think about the Bible, you think about that book that's right there in your lap. Truly, it's a unique book in that it is a book filled with blood from cover to cover. There's no other book like it. This has blood flowing through every page. From Genesis to Revelation, we see a trail of blood proclaiming the Lord's redemption. I mean, think about this, Vivi. I have no way to quantify this. I have no way conceptually to even picture it. But in the Old Testament sacrificial system, year after year, generation after generation, all across the land, there would be millions of gallons of blood that were shed in order to cover the sins of the people. And yet, year after year, bucket after bucket, the blood never stopping all of that blood never saved one soul. Enter Jesus. And what the blood of bulls and goats and lambs could not accomplish, the blood of Jesus has now brought to pass. This is why we sing, thank you God for the blood. Because these verses give us insight into what the blood does for all of those who will trust in Jesus by faith. The old covenant was full of blood itself. And in fact, the verses we just read draw primarily from uh, the Old Testament book of Exodus. You can go read Exodus 24 this week and do a little cross study there. And in that passage, you'll see where the, the account of the ratifying of the Old Covenant by Moses and the people. The book of the law was sprinkled with blood. The people were sprinkled with blood. The tabernacle was sprinkled with blood. All the furnishings were sprinkled with blood. There was blood everywhere. I mean, I don't know how to picture a more solemn and even gruesome occasion for this blood to just be all over. Okay, so why is it then that the blood of Jesus is so precious? It's because through the blood of Jesus, we who are sinners can now enter into that place where we could have never gone before, into the presence of God. Now physically, we are right here on earth, but spiritually now for those who are in Christ, you have access, you have communion with the God of the universe. And in order for God to receive any of us into his fellowship, that blood that was spilled had to be applied to the person. We enter his presence by the blood of Jesus. What Christ now offers believers those who will turn and trust in him with all that they are. What he offers is our benefits beyond our capacity to fathom. Certainly beyond my ability to articulate. What he offers is, is more than we could dream. He offers the chance for our own indictful spirit, the guilt that we have to silence the charges of accusation. We think about our enemy, the blood of Jesus disarms Satan so that no longer death can be used as something to enslave us. We talked about that in uh, the chapters previous, how the very fear of death has now been conquered. It is through the shed blood of Jesus, the text says that we get an eternal redemption through cleansing. The goal of this redemption 
that he secured is to bring us into fellowship with him so that we might know him and so that we might serve him. Is there a more fitting response for the people who are gathered here today? As we think about the precious blood of Jesus, is there any other response that is worthy other than lifelong worship of Jesus? Amen? Now let's look at the last section. Pick it up in verse 23. The word of God says, therefore it was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves to be purified with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with hands, only a model of the true one, but into heaven itself so that he might now appear in the presence of God for us. He did not do this to offer himself many times as the high priest enters the sanctuary yearly with the blood of another. Otherwise, he would have had to suffer many times since the foundation of the world. But now he has appeared one time at the end of the ages for the removal of sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for people to die once and after this judgment, so also Christ having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Guys, access to God is a big deal, a huge, huge deal. And it's made possible only through the blood of Jesus. And what we see in this last section is that what we can never forget is that Christ suffered and Christ saves. He suffered and he saved to make all of this possible. Because my, my, my hope is that if a person comes into this place for the first time, and then after gathering with us leaves, man, I desperately want them to think those people here in this place are hung up on Jesus. Like they are not over it. They are not over what he has done because that is the truth. This right here is our hope that because Christ suffered, now he is able to save. Because he spilled his blood, access to God is now available for those who will look to him within faith. This all leads to this glorious truth. The truth that Christ's sacrificial death was sufficient to end the need for these continual offerings. It says that he put away sin forever. Guys, if that's what he did by the sacrifice of himself, do you not think the guilt that you are carrying today can be given to him once and for all? Whatever it is that's tripping you up today, man, he wants to receive that. This whole chapter, as we think about Hebrews 9, teaches us that Christ is the great high priest who secures an eternal redemption for his people by shedding his own blood. And as a result, Jesus is now the mediator of a new and a better covenant. Hebrews 9, 22 told us that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And yet we have a savior who did just that. What the blood of animals could have never done, Jesus accomplished in Every single one of those sacrifices foreshadowed and pointed forward to what Jesus would do on the cross. This last section tells us how Jesus' blood, it purifies the heavenly places, it puts aside sin forever, and it is the guarantee of the final salvation for all of those who will look to him. Because we must remember that while we speak of salvation as a free gift, and praise God it is, This free gift was quite costly. This free gift Jesus paid for with his very life. He came to seek and to save and to rescue. His death allowed him to, as the text says, bear the sins of many. He suffered so that he might save. Uh, I came across a story of an evangelist who would once travel around preaching and leading all over the country. One day, after he had concluded a a whole week's worth of revival services, a young boy came to him and asked him, what must I do to be saved? And the man replied, I'm sorry, it's too late. And the the boy who kind of had a temper said, you're telling me it's too late because I've missed your services? He said, no, it's too late because Jesus already paid it. 
It's too late because the question is no longer what must I do, it's what has he done? What must we do? Believe on him. Trust that just like the song we sing about is filled with truth, that Jesus actually did pay it all. And once and for all. Once and for all. That sounds too simple, doesn't it? Praise God for it. He paid the price. Once and for all. He lived the perfect life that I couldn't. Died the sacrificial death that was meant for me and rose again so that I could join him in new life and in victory. Because that's the invitation of Jesus. What we must do is believe that Jesus is enough, turn from sin, and trust in him. I don't know what measure of guilt you carry around today, but I'm telling you, he can take it. He's already paid the price for it. You don't have to ask him to pay the price again. It's already been settled. So release that guilt and let's get to work. Let's follow him. Uh, there's, a, there's a song I remember growing up singing that went like this. I'm not gonna sing it, but. Uh, but the song, you know, it says, there's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. How can blood make us spotless? It's because it's the blood of Jesus, the Son of God, the perfect Lamb, the only one who could have done it. And so my prayer today is that for every believer in the room, that you will not walk out of here carrying a measure of secret guilt that somehow paralyzes you from what God wants to do in you and through you. Would you give it to him? And if you're not a believer, would you take that same guilt that we know that you have, because we all do, and give it to him? Confess your sin, trust in Christ, and allow him to be your savior. And as we respond today, I wanna to encourage you to be obedient to whatever it is the Holy Spirit is telling you to do. Maybe today you need the encouragement that comes through prayer. I would love to pray for you. We've got people in the room who would love to pray for you. I'll be right down here as we sing. Maybe today you're ready to step out in faith and trust in Jesus as a Christ follower. There's no more important thing that could happen today than you to hear the call of the Holy Spirit to respond in faith. Whatever it is that God is calling you to do, we want to walk with you. And so as we sing, we encourage you to be, be faithful, be obedient to what God is telling you to do. After this time of response, we're gonna participate in a living lesson called the Lord's Supper. And we invite all who are in the room who are believers in Christ to participate in this moment with us. But first, scripture tells us that before we jump into partaking of this meal, that we need to examine our hearts and examine our hearts to make sure that there is no root of bitterness or root of dissension within us. During this time of response, if you're not a believer, I would just implore you to confess your sin to God and ask him to forgive you on, based on the finished work of Christ. If that's you, you can come here to the front. We would love to help you uh, just celebrate that and, and, and solidify that in your own heart. But if you are a Christ follower, use this time as a time of prayer to consider what it is that God has been doing in your life. Consider what it is that God wants from you. Consider where you might have fallen short, where you're holding on to the vestiges of the past instead of seeking him with all that you are. We'd love to pray for you. I'll lead us at the end of this as we come back, but let's just take a moment to respond with prayer and whatever it is that God wants to do in us and through us, amen? Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you would just make it come alive in our hearts today. Father, lift my words that fall woefully short and Father, press them deep into our hearts so that we might be able to treasure who you are and what you've done. Lord, we give this time of response to you as we lift our voice, we, we, we sing it out as an offering of praise. But Father, I also ask that you would do a work in the hearts of your people. Move us, Father, to be obedient. Move us to faithfulness. Move us to trust you in every way. We pray this now in the name of Jesus.